evening, everyone, from snowy Davos. My name is Ami Kutecha, and as chair of the KULS ESG and Sustainability Forum, a very warm welcome to you all to today's webinar, webinar titled Nature-Based Solutions and Are They a Panacea to Resolve the Climate Change Problems that We Have in Rural and Urban Environments? Now, we all know that turning to nature and natural remedies to cure and redress human ills is a very well-proven process and has very, very beneficial outcomes. However, we also know that nature needs time. And time is something that we don't have in, in responding to this climate crisis, which is, which is making us all more and more vulnerable every passing day in our rural and our urban habitats. So wh whilst we had a landmark agreement uh, at COP15 in Montreal earlier, um, it was, sorry, at, at the end of last year, which talked about reversing environmental degradation and biodiversity degradation by 30% by 2030. And of course, it is a very, we very welcome and positive outcome of the COP. Can we rely on nature-based solutions to address the problems we have at the speed and the scale that we require? That is the question that our expert panelists, led by our very capable moderator today, John Deersley, who is Joint Director and Head of the Natural Capital at Savills, will, uh, will, will answer for you guys. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And with that, I'd like to hand over to John Deersley to kick off today's session. Over to you, John. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And um, I say good morning. Good morning from the UK, at least, where I know that Kelly is joining us from. But um, two further fantastic panellists in, in Jason and Ocean joining from very different parts of the world. So um, great to have an international perspective on the panel. Um, Amy introduced the topic there um, as one that we just want to have a a really well welcomed discussion or conversation, I think your words were about. So the, the format for today, at least, is one where we've got some questions, but we'd love more questions to come in from people watching this webinar. You can hit it on the Q&A button on Zoom um, and hopefully get those through. It's very much designed to be a discussion around this concept of you know, nature based solutions. Are they going to solve all our problems? Um, and I think you know we we can recognize the challenges. But actually, I want to pick out some worked examples, some real life examples from all the panelists to see how are these working? How do we prioritize them? What do we do with them? So that's our, our plan today. Um, just working around the panelists, I mean, um, let me introduce myself, which I won't do much further. All I would usually say is the summary version for me is I'm a farmer by breeding and training. So um, I probably should be sat outside rather than in a warm, cozy office, uh, like um, someone on our team. Um, but that's that's me, really. Um, Jason, uh, I've got here that you're an award winning architect, academic author and TV presenter. So I'm already feeling a little bit inferior. Uh, but um, it's probably worth you giving a, a one line intro, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I think that you just summarise it by saying an architect. I guess I draw lines for a living. Uh, and so I somehow make those lines come to sort of series of spaces. And if I was to kind of ask my daughter, what do I do for a living? I think she'll probably say the same thing. I see you at the drawing board doing these beautiful pictures and they suddenly become a bit of reality. But I think it's really important this, in this day and age to be able to try and um, bring the green agenda to a broader public. And that is why the academic the book writing and the TV seems to fall into place. And uh, I guess that's what I do. Brilliant. And Kelly, just, just working down my, my list, I'd just say hello. Um, I've got here again, you know, you do two jobs. So one is a one is a research, one is a consultant. Just give us one line on, on your background. Yeah, I always find it hard to succinctly say what I do. I'm, you know, for, for shortness, I always just say I'm an environmental scientist. So seems to cover most areas, you know, dipping into landscape ecology. I've sort of done some, you know, lab work and genetics work, um, but currently I'm a nature-based solutions consultant for, for Atkins and um, just finishing off a PhD at King's College London. Perfect. Um, and just last but certainly not least, I went to Ocean last because I think he was confessing it's four o'clock in the morning where he sat, so you might want another mouthful of coffee before I asked him to talk. <laughs> Uh, but Ocean, do you want to just give an intro to you? 
I did my jumping jacks as soon as I got up. I'm like, get this blood pumping. I mean, I definitely feel a bit of an underdog compared with these um, panelists. I mean, there are really some impressive work. Um, and I would definitely have to say, I think having a, a, a very, um, I guess, new, new uh approach into the professional world. Um, I would say I'm, I'm really bringing a, a flavor from the Caribbean, from an, an island state perspective, as well as, I guess, uh, that sort of youth and that drive uh, to inspire people uh, around this age, uh, as well as, I guess, um, other people within within these communities um, to really get on board and, and see, the, see the potential. I think that's what it is about seeing, about dreaming. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you all. And um, what I wanted to do was just my, dare I say, my prerogative on this is to just share one slide. And the reason I wanted to share this one slide with you all is, um, I mean, this is a, a blatant plug as much as the other, but Samuels had a, a, a research, nature-based solutions research publication out fairly recently. And we were trying to find an image for the front page, for the front cover. And what we did is we ended up drawing this picture. Um, it certainly wasn't my colouring, and I can promise you that. But the, the, the thought process here is when I think about nature-based solutions, I see probably what is quite a rural landscape. I see multiple different things going on on there. We've got 15 listed out, but actually, you know, this probably is, could only exist in sort of child's coloring pen rather than in real life, in the, in the applied world that we all live and work in. And um, I mean, probably to get things kicked off Kelly, what do we mean by these nature-based solutions? You know, do they look like colouring in on a page or, or what do we mean by them? Um, nature-based solutions are quite, you know, the, the simple definition is that they are actions to use nature or natural processes, which in some way address a societal problem and provide multiple benefits to people. Um, so a simple example would be afforestation or just tree planting in general. Um, if, it's, if it's done to address a problem like um, climate mitigation, so to sequester carbon, then it's a nature-based solution. But often they have multiple benefits, what we call co-benefits. So it will also probably help to reduce um, flood risk or provide biodiversity enhancement, things like that. So they generally have multiple benefits, um, but they, they need to address some sort of challenge if, if they put in place for, for that action. Um, the one thing to say is their, pro, you know, their sole purpose can't be for, for biodiversity enhancement because then we're just really talking about conservation. So it has to be something and biodiversity enhancement. That's really interesting. And I mean, actually, I think trying to summarize it there, I get bombarded with the, the marketplace examples that come through and actually the finances behind a lot of this. And we might unpick some of that later, but actually in sort of quite a pure view, it's just this concept of, it, of using nature to, to solve a problem. And it's kind of, you know, very helpful that, that we have that finalized view. Um, I mean, one thing, Jason, that, that you know, I um, thought about, I'm sure, many times is, is Kelly talked about biodiversity as one part of it, but it could be carbon, it could be water quality. Now, in a, in a practical world, you know, and I, I talked about finance there, and it will be a theme that I probably bring up several times through this, because one thing I want to make sure of is we get this that's a practical position. You know, we can yeah. slightly say, oh, if we had unlimited funds, we'd do everything. But of course, the reality is, is how, how do we start to, when, you know, when you're looking at a building or a design of a site, whatever else it might be, how do you sit there and go, right, OK, I've got this theoretic list. John's just shown me a list of 15 items. How do I yeah. prioritise them? How do I pick out what's best? Lovely question. And you know what? I was looking at that image and I'm thinking, I missed that. I actually missed those big gardens, those farms and everything, because here I am in high density Singapore spatially constrained island city-state where we don't necessarily have the privilege of open space. So when you talk about nature-based solutions, I look at that and I'm thinking, oh my God, that's my childhood in the UK. But here I am in Singapore where we look at sky courts, sky gardens, green terraces. That's our nature-based solution. And ultimately it's about then establishing how much space you actually have. That's the financial equation. You can't simply bring a farm into the middle of the city. So in our case, what we're finding is that we look at the high density nature of Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and we start to see how legislation is being passed to allow the developers to say, 
I can build more if I can incorporate certain green attributes. If I'm going to be bringing in sky courts, sky gardens with lush urban greenery, there is sometimes an allowance that can be provided that would allow me to build more density if I am still bringing in that urban greenery into the heart of my inner city development. And so I guess it's a bit of a, like a carrot and the stick, isn't it? You want to be able to kind of allow the developer to do the right thing. But at the same time, there is that sort of that opportunity for the, the, the carrot being dangled um, to allow them to also bring uh, the, the greenery in. Then in terms of the hierarchy of what you can do, there is quantifiable measures. Uh, for instance, the green plot ratio method is a bit like kind of understanding a shopping list of greenery that would allow you to think, if I've got 12 trees and it has a particular carbon offset opportunity, I can't fit those 12 trees on the ground. Okay. I could actually get the same quantum of carbon offset if I was to apply it to turf, shrubs, plants. And all of a sudden you've got this natural kit of parts that provides quantitative measures to palm trees. Uh, her, palms, shrubs or whatever and you can then start to build that kit of parts as vertical gardens and so the ability to then pick and choose from that palette is the direction that we're often seeing many high density cities going to as they approach those nature-based solutions. Jesus, so you know, throwing questions at you here because it just sparks my thought process going. You talked about you know growing up in the UK and then now operating in Singapore you know is there a is there a better model? Is there a is there a luxury in the UK that means we don't have to think as in, uh, as as innovatively in this space? You know what what drives those two differences? Well, I think that there. I mean, space is one of the key factors here, and I think that if you've got the luxury of space, you can be doing more with those nature based solutions. And so, if you're working in high density urban habitats, you're finding yourself having to try and find whatever way you can to encourage the urban greenery to enter back into your city in order to create more biodiversity. And then, with that, it's a question of then. Um, ensuring that the legislation is in place to bring everybody on that journey so that civil society are aware that, for instance, one square meter of rooftop garden can absorb six liters of water. So if you can start to understand the quantifiable measures of carbon sequestration, water retention, noxious pollutant absorption, all of these um, measures, these quantifiable measures will actually encourage us to be making the right decision. And, and actually, for, for me, hearing you talk about legislation and the role of legislation in this, actually, I, I see legislation as the sort of pump primer. But everyone I've spoken to in this space, once they open their eyes and actually look and know what they're looking for, all of a sudden, I think they are um, uh, massively more incentivized to actually go out and, and they will personally choose to live in a space that might have these benefits or work in a space that has these benefits. So I think the legislation in my mind is the pump primer, but then actually the, the, the ultimate driver in this will be the marketplace. And I think it won't be too long before we have this sort of shift in baselines, what shift and what people consider acceptable. You know, actually, you know, if you go back 100, 200 years, see a coal power station pumping out, you know, noxious fumes, you'd sort of accept that. All of a sudden we won't now. And I think we're on this massively accelerated curve that I think people want to look out of their windows, see trees, see open space, see greenery, maybe see them inside their buildings as well. So for me, that's certainly the, the bit that speeds along. Indeed. Just to add to that, John, mm -hmm. um, do you know what? I think COVID actually was a great help in some weird way of the transition of mindsets because it gave the... Uh, everybody a sort of sense of experience to really put something into perspective you were able to see what it's like to be in a city with less cars with less noise with less pollution in the air for an extended period of time in india the smog went down they saw the taj mahal dolphins came to the venice rivers people understood what it was very very clearly because people need to see things it's very well and good that we we speak academically we have these circles we almost preach to the converted 90 percent of the time but when you have this massive population experiencing what it is like just like what you're saying this this curve people are now uh, from experience are uh, able to to find that will within themselves to also join uh, for for this collective good which i think is a really important uh, factor 
And Ocean, I mean, just in, in terms of that, you talk about the people element in this, and Jason talked about the intensity. What? Why don't we just, you know, sorry, we talk about the intensity of space and our space is the limiting factor. Surely there is a, a logical argument here to say, pick up the nature-based solutions that we think we need from our societies and disconnect them from towns where space is always going to be a limiting factor. Why don't we just pick these up and put them well, let's go extremes. Let's, so let's just put them all in the Sahara Desert. You know, there's loads of space over there. Let's go and do it there. Well, I mean, for me personally, um, you know, cities are now also becoming the default human experience, which is which is a, a, an immense, just to unload that. I mean, compared to growing up in the Caribbean on a sailboat, like I barely saw people. Uh, and now I live in the middle of London. And it's predicted that 70% of the world population will live in cities by 2050. So we now have to really consider what is the default uh, uh, experience we want. And also by that effect, uh, cities also produce 80% of the economy as well as 70% of carbon emissions. So we actually need to have those solutions in, in the area where it's most uh, useful uh, and going to have a huge effect. So I would say that so yes kelly i mean it's, it's just not only you know we need the solutions where we are to to have an impact where we are but there's also tons of research to show just how important exposure to greenery is for for human well-being and mental health which is touching on what you were saying related to to covid absolutely uh, my my background is also in biophilic architecture i didn't really mention that in the bio as well so which, which is which is that uh, that shared ecosystem between the human experience and and um the nature nature ecosystems within within the built within the built environment which i'm sure jason might have a lot of thoughts on <laughs> well it's, it's so um just to pick up on the, the, the socio-physiological part i mean a few years ago there was this fantastic academic who basically got 25 uh, students into a room and played them a horror movie and he wired them up on these monitors to basically track their heart rates as they're watching the scary movie and naturally as the scary bit comes up their heart rate would jump and he then got them to look at a city scene to see how long it would take for their hearts to return to normal. He then did a similar exercise with, I'm assuming a different horror movie, um, but then he got them to look at a green scene. And what we could see is that heart rates return to normal a lot quicker by looking onto greenery. So it's no surprise that when we look at sort of healthcare environments, uh, increasingly prisons, um, we are seeing the opportunity for urban greenery to really have this calming effect. That's why it's so linked to our health and well-being and something that we should be encouraging to come back into our cities. So I think that it goes beyond just the environmental benefits of sort of absorbing noxious pollutants or uh, absorbing excess rainwater. It does have have a huge impact on our sort of socio-physiological being. And Jason, on that, I mean, you know, I, I'm with you, by the way, I, I get the logic in terms of why we need to bring these into, into the, the urban space. You, you've put in the chat here some guidelines around green guidelines. Do you want to just quickly take us through those, maybe just the headline thoughts? Absolutely. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called The Sky Court and Sky Garden, Greening the Urban Habitat, which was basically looking at how we need to be encouraging urban greenery to come back into our cities and in a more quantifiable fashion. Um, what we're also conscious of is that we as humans want to have the open space for us to be able to socially interact. But how do you interact at height if you're in a 60, 70, 80 story building? The Sky Court and Sky Garden can be a means of spatial replenishment we can actually start to interact and we do see similar guidelines creeping in uh, in and around various high density cities by being able to green those spaces it then offers the environmental benefit and the lush guidelines are basically a series of guidelines that starts to quantify as opposed to qualify i mean we love to get the old pens out to beautiful landscapes and think this looks beautiful because of the greenery but what is the quantifiable aspect of that greenery and how can it provide better environmental solutions? The guidelines are there to basically be a rule of thumb for designers to kind of say, if this is the space that I have, what greenery can I bring in? What sort of open spaces can I bring in at height? 
either intermediary in a tower or even at the top of the tower. And that can also provide an opportunity for having GFA exemptions, gross floor area exemptions, even enhancing the amount of developable space that you might have. And I think that we're starting to see these sort of guidelines, you know, in Tokyo, in Hong Kong, and I think that is part and parcel of the way that we are able to shape high density urban habitats of the future. That's really interesting. And I mean, Kelly, just, just turn to you a second on this one. I mean, um, you and I both operate in the UK and um, we look at the legislation coming through. Again, you you brought up here, London's introduced an urban green factor, for example, which I'm personally not familiar with, but, but legislatively, you know, things like biodiversity net gain in England, nutrient neutrality in certain parts of the country, water neutrality, you know, how are they starting to drive the, the interest in nature-based solutions in your sort of advisory role? Um, well, it's, it's becoming a huge deal. I mean, in England, biodiversity net gain is now coming to law and, and um, so all new developments are required to make sure that um, biodiversity is actually improved or the natural world is improved by at least 10% um, post-development compared to pre-development. And, um, and so it's, I guess it's kind of caused a bit of a panic amongst developers and constructors and because nobody, it's a very complicated metric to, to undertake to do those assessments. And um, so, yes, I think it is sort of creating a bit of a panic, but it's also creating a bit of drive. And as you say, I think eventually down the line, it will become the new norm. Um, but right now, people are still figuring it out. Um, the, the questions people are asking, is this just going to become another tick box exercise? Or, you know, it's just going to be a way that people are going to be um, trying to game the system. So is it really going to um, fulfill its intention to leave um, nature in a bit better state than before? And so those are things we, we're still figuring out. Uh, I would just say that, you know, if it's done in its, you know, according to its spirit, what it's achieved, and if it's done according to you know using the existing legislation um, and policy to protect the rarest features um, then it should really work for for biodiversity but also you know the the people who, who need to enforce it they need the right and um, the right amount of resources and you know our local authorities are really under resourced and if they don't have the people who can fully understand it and help their, their applicants, then, you know, then it's not going to really work. Um, Kelly, I think you just hit on a, a really interesting point there about understanding. And I think education has a huge part to play here. Um, when I kind of think about the, the education system where it can be incredibly siloed, where you go and disappear to do architecture, you go and disappear to do urban planning, you go and disappear to do landscape design, you go away and disappear to do interior design. And yet it's incredibly integrated nowadays. I mean, an interdisciplinarity is key. When I went to do the, the PhD, I was put into an architect's department, an architecture department, but I was actually thinking, hold on, my research is actually on gardens, sky courts, sky gardens. So I ended up having one professor who was actually an architect, or one professor who was actually a landscape architect, and another professor who was an urbanist. And I think we need to start thinking about the education system to encourage a greater flow across those disciplines. And I think that education will also spur those policymakers to actually start thinking over the garden fence, looking over the garden fence to actually make a better, uh, better environment. And I mean, Jason, just picking up on that and, and maybe looking to Ocean on this one. I mean, it feels like we've been in this transitionary journey. So to start with, we were designing, you know, buildings, spaces, whatever else like that. And we've had this environmental sort of bolt on, if that makes sense. So so we've, we've started off with our primary purses and then we're putting these sticking plasters on to try and meet the various demands. When, when you're looking at design, how, how do we invert or should we, perhaps is the question, should we invert that in terms of saying, no, we design a beautiful space that delivers for biodiversity, delivers for nature, delivers for carbon, whatever way we want to look at it. And how do we slot the people and the buildings and the built infrastructure and the sewage treatment works and all the glorious things that we have to deal with in life? How, how do we balance those two requirements? Uh, was that to me or Jason? sorry it was it was yeah or anyone yeah um well I, quickly off the top of my head i would I, I would like to poke a hole at um the neom development i am absolutely not a fan of that and that i think would be uh very much 
kind of coming from that 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 way of 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 just starting somewhere fresh and doing something completely um retrofitted to what uh to what different goals are in terms of sustainability but i i think it's very inward looking and i think it lacks a certain flavor of what a city actually means what is the essence of a city and all i i think personally people are also and street life uh, and the way that people interact with each other is also a nature-based solution um and having something that is kind of falsely created i don't feel necessarily um really encapsulates what it means to have a human experience um i mean i'm i'm happy to be proven wrong i'm happy to discuss it um and i'm i can't wait for it to be finished because i will definitely go to see um and analyze but i mean i'm very curious to find out what other people's thoughts are on this i mean or just Jason, to, you, very, you, know, you seem very triggered here. No, no, no. I mean, I think that um, I, won't, I won't make sort of reference to some of the Saudi um, projects. I mean, I think that um, what you're saying, John, about the um, how, how are you going to get there? How are you going to actually bring nature based solutions into the fold that sort of break down boundaries? And the only way you're going to be breaking down those boundaries is to think of education as well as the city, both the systems of systems. And I think that what this means is that we need to be moving away from the architect does a bit and then tax on a bit of landscape and then an engineer comes in and then puts on some solar panels on the roof. This is just not it. And I think that the only way you're ever going to get to a sustainable product is if you have a sustainable process in place. And that means the interdisciplinarity. That means bringing the different parties together around the table to roll up the sleeves and have an actual conversation. Sure, the architectural profession has, for many moons, set out a framework for which other disciplines have been able to kind of plug into. But that doesn't always need to be the case. I mean, if we think about how an environmental engineer or a services engineer could be taking the lead in terms of encouraging natural light, natural ventilation, um, bringing in urban greenery to help reduce the temperatures and so on and so forth. All of a sudden, you're going to start to see um, other disciplines within the built environment taking the lead. And so I'm kind of encouraging that sense of everybody kind of coming in and having a voice as opposed to the typical architect brandishing the black pen and saying, hey, I've got a solution. I'll actually make something look beautiful. And then afterwards, we'll start adding on the, the, you know, the technology, which ultimately is not a sustainable thing to do. If I could just jump into that point, Jason, that's you, you're saying exactly what ecologists everywhere have been saying for, for decades. It's like bring ecology in sooner, right from the beginning at the design stage, bring in the ecologists, not after you've designed everything and like, oh, now we need a baseline survey. And, and this is like if ecologists can be part of the design from the very beginning, then we will deliver um, benefits for both people and nature and for biodiversity. So, so yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to sort of um, just pause there for a second, just to, to try and encourage people, <clears throat> please, to put questions in the Q&A box. And um, we're sort of roughly halfway through. These things definitely work best when we get input from others. So if you have anything you're thinking about or wondering about, please don't be afraid. Stick it in there. Um, definitely rather have too many than too few. So um, please, please do put some questions in the Q&A. Um, Kayla, you, you and Jason there were talking um, about bringing people together and this cohesion that's needed. I mean, actually, one thing that um, I, I see in, in, a, in a rural context here is that the urban and rural environments are being pulled together uh, and pulled together through this sort of change in thought process. Uh, and actually, you know, we've always looked at agricultural land of providing food. Um, and actually, I think food is still a very important part of this. But no longer the rural role is only to provide food. I mean, COVID was mentioned earlier, we saw this huge explosion, the social benefits that outdoor space yeah. and rural land can bring. But actually, a lot of my role is, is how the uh, environmental benefits, you know, actually also flow from rural land. And I mean, I just I just really wanted to look at, I suppose, a little bit one one case that I've worked on just to try and bring this to life a little bit. So we we look after um, or work with an estate in, in Warwickshire, a place called Ragley Hall. Uh, lots of you will know it. It's worth Googling. So it's a very impressive building. But actually, you know, like a lot of traditional uh, rural estates, there was bits of land. Some of it were, uh, had a very clear purpose, let's say. Other bits of land, it's much harder to define what it was used for. 
Um, and the bit we were looking at was 30 hectares, roughly 100 acres um, of, of land that, um, you know, sat on the edge of a town but didn't have a development purpose. It couldn't really be farmed that intensively, partly because of um, some unauthorised access, also part of the site flooded. And actually, as a result, this site was ended up just being neglected. And because it was being neglected, we did end up with some degree of sort of scrub um, build up and things like that. Now, that would have been OK, uh, you know, certainly had a purpose in some situations. But but actually, this also also had a load of archaeology underneath it. So we were really keen to preserve the archaeology and not let the roost mass get down into the thing. So all of a sudden we've been head scratching and, and the estate had been head scratching for a few years on this because it is a challenge. And actually, you know, a couple of years ago, we started looking at this and saying, well, how do we take a site like this and use nature based solutions to reinvent it? So actually, you know, Kelly, you mentioned biodiversity net gain by taking that grassland that had just been agriculturally improved many years ago and received sheep grazing to actually put a proper management plan in place to think about how that works. We've then got this uh, this biodiversity uplift. And this uplift is now a quantifiable, you know, we've got the DEFRA metric, you know, quantifiable uplift that we can look at. We've also got an emerging soil carbon position. Um, and actually, I think, you know, some of the, the legislation and verification around soil carbon in the UK needs some thinking, um, but it is emerging, it is working. And what we're seeing is actually through soil test data, we're going to start to see that soil organic matter build up. So we've got a biodiversity uplift. We've also got a um, carbon capture piece, not, not through woodland creation, but actually through soil carbon, incredibly powerful measure there. Um, equally, I mentioned the site has some flooding within it. Actually, what we're also looking at here is, um, you know, how we work with the EA with regards to flood defence uh, and actually mitigating the flood flooding in Ulster, which is the nearest town. And so, again, using this this land as a place to store water, slow it down, hold it when we need it, release it at an appropriate time. You know, all of a sudden these things bundle up. And and the final bit, which, again, I, I won't dwell on, but, you know, this concept around the, the social engagement, this is a bit of land on the edge of the town. The estates are very aware that actually it's not about pushing up a big fence and saying no. Um, it's about managed and structured access. And I think I, I would say that actually people everywhere does sometimes have some conflicts. So, you know, it's really hard to encourage ground nesting birds if we've got lots of dog walkers. You know, that would be a quite well understood one. Equally, it's quite hard to grow lots of food if we're really keen to preserve soil carbon, for example. So there are some conflicts and I think we shouldn't shy away from those. But, but what I wanted to just demonstrate there was actually that within the rural context as well there is an ability to take all the things we've been doing and slightly supercharge them you know taking 100 acres of land out of a densely populated city is going to be a no-go but actually by bringing it into the rural context you've got space and and dare i say we've got time as well i i, I don't want to be considered a country bumpkin but i do think the rural environment probably moves slightly slower uh, and so as a result we don't necessarily need to redevelop everything every five years and that was just, you know, for me, trying to pick out some examples of, of how the rural space might integrate into this. A really great example, John, because um, I think why we all attract, what attracts us about nature-based solutions is that nature is this great multitasker. And, and, you know, the example you gave demonstrated how it can achieve multiple different things, you know, from sequestering carbon to providing habitat for, for animals, for um, attenuating runoff, um, improving air quality. I mean, you know, the, the right planting in the right place, in the right conditions, um, it can achieve those things. Because there's also plenty of examples, like you said, where if it's full of invasive plant species or scrub or things, then, you know, it won't achieve to, to the same ability. And that's why the biodiversity net gain metric is about um, the condition of the habitat and its distinctiveness, and it takes all these things into consideration. And so what that legislation is doing is that people are now searching for um, bits of land where they can improve it somehow or protect it, like, you know, this bit of land that you're talking about in Ragley Hall, um, so as a, that they can offset from their development. So if they can't find enough biodiversity net gain units on, on their current development, then they're looking for them off site. And so it's creating this whole new market, just like, you know, carbon market around biodiversity. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting times that, that we're in in England.
Exactly. And, and Kelly, actually, I mean, you, you sort of tackled two of the questions that came through in the Q&A there, which I'm sure was very deliberate. So well done. <laughs> um, uh, but in, you know, there, was, there was a question coming in about how do we make sure that people aren't just playing the game in this? And I think Kelly explained very well that the metric and the science and actually the regulation behind this has, you know, it's maybe not perfect, but it's certainly been well thought through and is, is evolving. And, and equally, um, you know, this, this concept of, of being able to trade these credits, actually, I think that's a really innovative one because... Uh, I mean, in, in my mind, this has to stack up financially. Um, I think, you know, a legislative approach will get us so far. But I, I mentioned earlier on that, you know, I think people will be prepared to pay more, you know, certainly in the majority of situations as and when it's affordable for homes that offer a better standard or office space or commercial workplace. And I think that's definitely something that you will see as a, um, uh, a an ongoing theme. I mean, Jason, again, looking to, to Singapore, I mean, I, I, from the outside, think of Singapore as this fantastic green city. As, I'm assuming if you find certain bits of it that will be on a journey. Is is that fair? I mean, is, is there a story here in terms of how things evolve over time and how people get more used to it? I, I think there is. And uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the, um, the, I guess, in, in Singapore, he's often heralded as the, um, the father figure of Singapore um, or modern Singapore. Um, he was very quickly to really celebrate nature. Um, he wanted to create the Garden City, which then became the city in the garden, which is now the city in nature. I mean, it, it keeps on changing its kind of own identity. But um, it was kind of a very, very early approach to start really greening up the city so that he could create the Garden City. So there was a certain amount of investment early on, and there was no fear of actually wanting to invest in that fashion you do kind of get the sense that it was the legislation and that sort of will that actually pushed the city to be as green and lush as it is today. Uh, picking up on Justin's question there, how do you quantify nature-based solutions in a financially challenged market though? You can't really look at Singapore as that. You know, I, I start to think of places like uh, Jakarta and Manila, but what I find interesting about those cities, which can sometimes be financially um, charged, you start to kind of see how these nature-based solutions are trying to reduce consumption, energy consumption. For instance, the air conditioning units, all those anthropogenic sources of heat, all of those sort of um, outdoor environments that are still having ridiculous air conditioning being pumped out there and just being incredibly gas guzzling. So what they're starting to understand is that by planting greenery, you could help reduce ambient temperatures by anything between one and four degrees centigrade meaning that you're getting to comfort controlled levels that people are feeling comfortable with. So the ability to plant those social spaces, both on the ground at height, without having to rely on artificial mechanical means to, um, to comfort control is where the greenery is starting to creep into those high density cities. And so I think that over the course of the last 10 years, we've started to see those financially challenged markets, as Justin put it, to, to start to see how the greenery can offer uh, economic benefits uh, as well as the environmental and the social benefits. Actually, um, Jason, you, you talked there a lot about Roderick's question. You know, um, he mentions that you know uh, one of London's greatest attributes is a lot of <clears throat> sorry, a lot of green open space, and actually how through the management of that green open space, you know, it's not just the developers and the architects, but actually also you know maybe the local authorities' obligations and commitments here to to make the most of that. And ocean, I mean, again, I I just look at this concept in terms of where do we start this design process you know is it this idea that buildings you know there's a question here about road pollution for example as well how how do we fit that into the the um, the overall landscape design i mean this this idea of a top down approach do we need bottom up examples to sort of leach in where where do you sit on that debate of of how best to sort of structure these competing uses for space well i think that um you know just to, to qualify there when we look at um, high density urban habitats, uh, Sao Paulo, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, they are spatially constrained. And so we do not have the flexibility to basically be ripping out to create open space as such that will be sort of public open space. Um, when we get to a particular density, there's two ways. There's going underground or there's going above ground, as, as we see in, in certain sort of academic views relating to MRT systems, LRT systems. And that is basically 
what we're having to deal with in a high density urban habitat. I do think that um, when you look at those places that have started from scratch, and I think of Songdo in Korea as a classic example, um, this new, um, well, I say a new city, it was created back in the 1990s, it was finally delivered in early 2000s, um, there was the planning of open spaces from the get-go, and that required, back to our earlier point, that kind of synergy between the planner, the architect, the landscape, the ecologist, all coming together to ensure that we can find the public spaces, the pocket parks, and that is planned from the outset. Unfortunately, when I look at some of the high density urban environments that we're designing in, um, we're having to try and make use of the leftover spaces that have just kind of happened because of the increasing urban density. And that, that's where we start to think of those ground up solutions. How can we start leaning into those um, social groups that are wanting to turn those pocket spaces into something that is pleasurable? How can we turn those spaces into places um, activating them with recreational amenities that are shaded by greenery and are thus serving social functions as well as environmental functions. So I think it isn't just about the top down, it also requires a bottom up approach and increasingly we're seeing the support of academic institutions and industry wanting to fund proof of concepts to ensure that those spaces aren't just developed infinitum and that we can still continue to preserve those spaces for people to enjoy. Thanks, Jason. Ocean, you, Jason there talked about this, this need to get the, the bottom-up approach, to get the examples flowing. And, and if I understand this correctly, I mean, a lot of your thought process and work is, is actually about how we take these example projects and start to integrate them and feed the, the nature-based solution into, into the site design. Do you have any thoughts there in terms of how you get that out into the space? Uh, um, can you rephrase? I'm not, I'm not sure I quite understand. Yeah, sorry. So, so, um, sorry, probably wasn't clear. My sort of question, which Jason picked up on, was: Do we need a top-down approach, so a legislative approach, to say we're going to put some green space here and some development here, and this is how it's all going to look, or do we rely on the marketplace and those designing buildings and those who are designing these spaces? to feed it in naturally. So everyone looks and says, well, I think there's either a market opportunity or a moral obligation to deliver green space in this area and actually to just drip feed it in uh, from a sort of, you know, everyone doing their bit. And I suppose my question was, if you're looking at a site, do you start off and, and look at that design and say, how can I get my, whether it's 10% biodiversity net gain or my carbon mitigation or my water quality or my cooling, how do you get those into the examples that you work on? I would say that that is more the, even the starting point um, for me, because I think the experience of a journey through a space, its ability to edify people as they come through, um, you know, that is to provide like moral intellectual um, um, I, I, in, in, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, but what is the experience of the journey through a space, and how can you understand, maybe even subconsciously, um, those qualities that nature is, is 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 affording you in that space? So it becomes maybe not so much as meeting a quota or. Um, or as you know, as one or the other, it, it really becomes one one system. I mean, maybe that's a little bit um, obvious, but I I would say that one thing that I, I I do think about quite often is is how we how we have our perceptions of something through how something is labeled. So, for example, um, you know, everybody knows the miles on their cars, but how many people know the miles on their house? And so how can we start to also bring those those um, thoughts, like let's say on a real estate, because I know this is a real estate audience. So this is something that I thought I would I would say today, um, you know, you put, yeah, I want four bedrooms. I want, uh, you know, two bathrooms. What, what, what is the, what is a, a different way of looking at property, at, at finding something, you know, maybe it is that how many hours of light does this plot get uh what is what is the ability to produce food in this area what what is um what is what is maybe a happiness index how much public how much does it give back to the public so how can those actually be um you know sort of uh 
adjustment bars so that you can actually value land differently, value space in cities differently. And that becomes a way to also quantify and measure um, where we'll have a greater impact for projects um, in the future. Ocean, I think in three seconds, you probably just completely redesigned the Savills uh, sales brochures on every house and property that we look at. So, uh, you know, I, I'm now going to have to have a sunshine index in the corner uh, floating away. So brilliant. I love it. I love it. Definitely. <laughs> And I mean, the, you, you do touch on some on some really key points there. We we've looked at houses in very functional space, but actually, um, I mean, particularly in the commercial environment, and you know, COVID has been a bit of a theme through this the, through this talk. But if we look at the commercial environment for a second, people are choosing to come back into the office uh, in a lot of situations. A lot of time, people are coming back into the office less than they were before. And our commercial spaces really need to offer more now than just a desk, a screen and a phone for them to meet that modern that modern demand um, in terms of people coming back in. I mean, uh, probably one again for Jason or for Ocean, just in terms of that design, when, when we're thinking about this site, and I keep coming back to this theme because it's just something that keeps res resonating in my brain is we've got all these priorities we've got to try and meet. You know, Kelly talks about the mitigation hierarchy or that the, 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 the defrometric in terms of biodiversity helps weight certain things higher than others. How do you design whether this is going to be nature first, telephone answering first, uh, you know, customer coming through the door first? How, how do you weigh those levers? So um, we have our own sort of um, view on sustainability that goes beyond what is often seen as the social, economic, environmental, to think of three additional pillars uh, being space, culture and technology. And uh, culture can be with a capital C, which is relating to um, those time-tested rituals, those elements that define us through music, art, literature, so on and so forth. But it can also be the cultural practices, whether it's the, 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 the cultural practices, of how you live, how you work, how you play, even just getting around the chess table in the middle of a park sort of thing. So um, we find that looking at culture, uh, whether it's capital C or small c, looking at technology that can actually enable um, greater uh, places to be used and also monitor our consumption. And that also means not just the energy consumption, water consumption, but also um, how the nature-based solution and the planting can be quantifiable in terms of reducing temperatures, uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions. Um, and then finally, so we've got we've, we've done the culture, we, we've, we've done the technology, the space. Um, what is the proportion of space that we would yield to um, giving back to the urban habitat? And that is either space on the ground or it's space in the sky. Now, when you're looking at you know, your, 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 your plot ratio calculations, you know that there'll be a certain amount of area that you do need to surrender. But we would advocate that there may need to be additional space in a high density environment, which would mean a proportion of your overall built up area that should be surrendered for social space at height, be that on the rooftop or intermediate within the tower or the high density development that would nurture social connection, interaction, foster greater sense of community at height. So we find that adding those three additional pillars also helps us frame those solutions so that we are starting to integrate from the outset the architecture, the landscape and the urbanism. Jason, that, that's perfect for, for me. I get that. It, it actually leads perfectly into a question we've had from Esther and there's no long word, so I'm going to read it um, word for word. Uh, does anyone on the panel have a view whether stacking will be possible? There are so many varying opinions, and I wonder whether there's something that is happening in measuring outside of England. So, so just for, for context on that, stacking this concept of using you know, the same thing and, and building on top of each other, not necessarily in a physical sense, but actually, you know, my, my Ragley Hall example, that one bit of land was delivering multiple ecosystem services, uh, and, that, and that's a situation. I mean, either Ocean or Kelly, did you want to have a go at just at that one? What's your thoughts on that question? No, no. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. Um, Jason, if you go to the I mean, just... 
So when, when you think about um, in, in the tropics, what we're having to do is actually go for multi-layering and stacking anyway, purely because of the threat of, of disease and um, insect infiltration, which will basically kill one particular species. So um, there, are, there are several things at play here. One, to try and ensure that we can retain an element of biodiversity and growth. The second one, the more layering that we can create, the greater what we call the leaf area index. So if we imagine that every single plant, shrub, tree has its own quantifiable leaf area, which, which then also relates to carbon sequestration, water retention, um, noxious polluted consumption. What we have is a layering. So you might have a value for the grass. You then have the overlayer of the shrub, which has an additional leaf area index. And then you've got the additional layer of tree or palm. And that layering actually increases the density of the, of, of the root bulbs of the, of the greenery, which will then have obviously benefits uh, when it comes to water, carbon, so on and so forth. So we find that this has become quite common practice in order to reduce the risk of um, one species failing, um, creating greater biodiversity, increasing the leaf area index, which is good for our green plot ratio. And then that means that we can go back to the kit of parts. You've got a Lego assortment, basically, and you can start picking species and putting them together, obviously not as whimsical as I'm mentioning, but obviously to ensure that there is biodiversity. And you can then start to assign that to horizontal surfaces, diagonal surfaces, or even vertical surfaces, which may have the same green value as a piece of horizontal grass, for instance. I think, oh, go on, Kelly. Um, not really just on that point, but I, I do find what I found frustrating working for some of the local authorities in England is that, you know, we, we design these beautiful spaces where we, we add on these green elements. And then when the development ends up being costing more than people expected or the prices go up, it's those green elements um, which really sort of solve the idea of, of the development or the design which then get left off. And I, I found that quite frustrating when I worked for, um, I will name names, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which has a living roof policy. It was one of the first boroughs to put in a living roof policy. And then on an ecology centre designed for in the park, which was designed to have a living roof. And um, yeah, it, it got left off because it was value engineered out. And, and I just find that's quite a shame. And I think that happen, happens all the time, is that these things get sort of bolted on and then, um, you know, they get taken off because they just cost too much. And that's where the education component comes in and the ability to demonstrate the value that is being added by that green roof, whether it is um, any of those metrics that, you know, mentioned earlier, uh, absorbing rainwater or, or reducing temperature or so on and so forth. And um, I think, you know, David makes a really valid point in that in that chat just now. He's like, oh, how do you then maintain it? Because that's another reason so many people just want to kind of get rid of the greenery on the rooftop, isn't it? They kind of think, well, who's going to look after this now? Um, in our experience in, in, in Singapore, certainly uh, it has been driven very much by the local authorities and then the legislation has insisted that the um, private sector estates then take ownership of those spaces and it's through a management system. Um, but saying that, um, in a scheme that we did in Sweden where we incorporated uh, vertical urban farms in order to grow enough tomatoes so that they could have their fika coffees mornings at 11 o'clock uh, it was actually managed by the community because they kind of saw it as an opportunity for themselves to get together and do a bit of harvesting um so i guess it's also the way that you kind of look at it people kind of get in you know fall in love with those allotments don't they and and if you can actually encourage that sense of community around you know smaller scaled um uh, green interventions i think it can actually be quite enjoyable yeah, but I think actually I, I also saw David's question and, and something that jumped into my mind is is the growing role of environmental charities um, in this space. You know, we're seeing a lot of nature based solutions in the UK being delivered by environmental charities uh, because they think you know, a, they're funded in different ways to make these sorts of things happen. But also you talk about education and they've got skills and experience in this area. Uh, and actually, whether 
you know, the funding challenges of local authorities and or the funding or the profit viability of the you know, um, commercial development means that actually there probably is a, a space in the in the Venn diagram overlap here for a really specialist form. And whether it's charitable, private or local authority, I don't have a view, but actually there is probably a new marketplace establishing. Uh, and I think you know, that is something that's really powerful, dare I say, for some of the you know people in the um, or some of the participants on this is looking for those opportunities. Because one thing that's very clear for me is that this financial growth that will come from this, whether it is large investment houses or people willing to just spend, you know, a little bit extra to be able to walk their dog in a green space or, you know, whatever else it might be, that that sort of thing will flow as a, as a new uh, a minimum operating standard. It, it won't be an optional extra. Well, interesting you mentioned that, um, John, because... Um, there's a policy that came out over here called the 30 by 30 policy, which means that um, post COVID, everybody's really scared that there is huge supply chain uh, uh, you know, challenges. Singapore had to be more self-sufficient. Can it actually generate 30% of its energy via clean sources within the country? And can it generate 30% of its food within the country because 85 to 90 percent of the food that we consume here is actually imported so all of a sudden you've seen a lot of rfps where um the government has basically said look at your rooftops of your buildings lease your rooftop don't give it over to air conditioning plants you don't always want to do a green roof but you may want to turn your roof into an urban farm that can then be third party or in, uh, uh, operated. And so all of a sudden you've got this burgeoning industry where people are taking the leftover space. And obviously at the scale of that roof is like a retail mall or an industrial center. You, you've got the opportunity to be reducing your, um, your running costs. If you've got a big metal roof in the middle of the tropics by putting an urban farm on top of it, which can actually help reduce temperatures, but also help sustain the uh, the food requirements for the the city state it's starting to move in the right direction brilliant thank you um oh, well kelly last point i think before we need to hand back to amy so yeah please go for yeah. it i was just uh, talking on both points about um you know community groups getting involved but also taking over sort of small spaces um here where i live in in wimbledon uh, it's run by the london borough of, of Merton, and we initiated a, a program to try and encourage local residents to green their streets and, and we thought the focus would be about people greening their, their front gardens because you know there is a bit of a problem in London of people paving over their front gardens things like that um, but when we introduced the the project people actually took to wanting to plant up around street trees like in the street tree bases and that's the sort of communal space which people go by and there was real conflict uh, tension between what the residents wanted to do to green these around the tree pits and in their verges and the council saying oh this is going to create problems with you know trip hazards or maintenance issues or you know they're coming up with a list of problems but at the same time the council saying okay but we see that this is a good thing and so you know the two sort of groups trying to work together to come up with solutions and part of it was the council just having to take a step back and like okay we're gonna we're gonna just wait and see what happens and and, and not you know you know be too so you can't do this and um, that yeah there hasn't been any problems and um, and so that program is sort of growing and that's just you know people finding these little spaces where they can grow and being enthusiastic about it and and the council just having to let people go with it but at the maintaining going but yes there is a risk that people will lose interest and then this you know you know will end up being in a worse state than it started so yes yeah, so it, it is interesting um how, how things are changing and moving I think hey, my, my final thoughts on all of this is a lot of time in this space, it's easy to say no, but we all know the right thing to do is to say yes. And I think um, actually as professionals in this space, if we can be slightly brave uh, and try and find reasons to say yes, rather than the safe way of saying no, uh, I think we'll probably start to see a lot of change. And ultimately that's what, what we want to see happen. Um, thank you to, to our panelists, particularly for giving up their morning and everyone who joined on. Um, I'm going to hand back to Amy, I think, who's just going to conclude matters. So thank you. Thank you very much, John, for uh, leading the panel discussion so ably. And to all our panelists, was a fantastic discussion, super inspirational, I thought, and with a load of calls to action. Uh, everything from thinking about happiness first and um, you know, centering our, our interventions, our nature-based interventions on human experiences. I thought that was a fantastic takeaway. 
um, makes us really, really think about what we want in our cities. And uh, and like Ocean said, we've got we've got to we've got to really make sure that the interventions we make are you know they work for everyone. That that is really really critically key, I think. Uh, and we are all sitting here in a very privileged environment. We've got to remember that there's loads of people out there who don't have access to this academic education, who we've got to reach in some way to make this happen. But the wonderful thing is how intuitive nature is to all of us um, and how carbon and uh, how carbon taxes are not. So um, let's try as, as much as we can, uh, give everybody on the call calls to action to actually include nature in the decision making every single day. I think that will be wonderful. Thank you all again. And thank you from Cambridge University Land Society to our very, very kind sponsors, Savills, to host this webinar series. We're looking forward to doing the next one on greenwashing claims, which will probably bring us all down to earth a bit after this. Um, and we are always looking for ideas for topics. We, we like to be very democratic. So everybody in the audience, whether you're a member of the society or not, of course, I encourage you to be a member of the society if you are an alum of, of, the, of the university um, and you're in the built environment sector, we'd love to have you on board. Um, but anyone who's on this, on this call, please do email either myself or John or any of the panelists that you enjoyed listening to today with any feedback that you have and any ideas for future, future topics. Uh, I'd really welcome that. Thank you from all of us here and uh, hope you all have a very good morning, afternoon or evening wherever you are. Thanks and goodbye.